The Shadow by Kevin Ranville Read by the author Chapter 1 Uprooted Somewhere along the tree line of a dying forest, near a half-dead village by a river, a young girl worked at destroying the world. She kicked her wooden fork into the dirt at the root of a berry bush. She pried the bush loose and pulled it from the soil. It shivered helplessly, struggling to hold on to the home it had always known. She yanked harder, and it came free. Little red berries tumbled from the branches, rolling onto the dirt. She picked those up, too, carefully. She walked over and tossed the bush and the berries on the pile. Then she stopped for a moment to glance across the skies to the east. The air was hazy, but the sky above was blue. Other villagers were digging up other bushes nearby. The sound of tools chuffing into the dirt faded off into the distance to the left and to the right. Dirty faces, sweating from labor, glanced around now and then. Some kept an eye on the sky, as Katie did, but mostly people worked, stopping only to swat at the pestering insects that their digging stirred up. The land was in ruin. The ground between the tree line and the village looked like a festering wound like a battlefield where only the forest had died. Other than a few winding trails leading back to the village like stony gray veins, there were only mucky puddles of various colors, brown, orange, gray, green. A few trees remained, some leaning, some fallen, some still standing, but all were dead, and there were no bushes, shrubs, or grasses anywhere. There were only tree stumps, otherwise, and so many cratered puddles where the rains had not been soaked up by the thirsty forest. The villagers worked in groups, organized by households. Katie, being an orphan, was paired with Meredy, the village elder, she and her brother lived with. The old woman was weak and slow, though, and her mind tended to wander. Katie wound up doing most of the work every day. Soldiers stood by, watching, pacing back and forth in their squeaky leather uniforms and shiny metal hats. They were sweaty as well and they swatted at the same in insects that pestered the villagers. But they did no work. Some strutted and strolled around. Some stood with their hands on the hilts of their swords. Some leaned on trees, grumbling. Occasionally they jabbed at folk with the butts of their spears, prodding them back to work when they stopped to lean on their tools for too long. There was smoke in the air. Workers hurried about with wooden carts collecting the uprooted berry bushes and tossing them onto fires in nearby pits. When a pile got too high, it was collected and taken away to be burned. The branches crackled as the flames took them, and the berries sizzled, letting go of their juices with a steamy hiss. The pillars of smoke reached high into the sky, and the air had a sweet smell to it. But the berries were poison. King Theron wanted to rid the world of them. He had them working in the thicket day after day without rest. The sooner the very last berry bush is burned to ashes, the sooner the world will be safe. They're poison, every last one of them, the guard captain had said, and you will all do your part to serve the land and your king in ridding the world of this menace. Katie wondered how poison could ever smell so sweet. She wore the short-sleeved gray cloth dress of a peasant girl. It was dirty from the work. It needed washing. She had a shirt pocket and a little hide satchel tied around her waist with a string. She wore little brown shoes made of animal skin. She stopped to dab her handkerchief at her watering eyes. Her dark brown hair clung to her forehead in sweaty clumps. She brushed it aside with the back of her hand and shoved the handkerchief back into her satchel. She scratched at her leg before grabbing her wooden fork again. Her leggings were making her itchy, as always. Her hands were sore, her legs were tired, her back ached. The berries were poison. Katie wondered if some of that poison was slowly getting into her, making her ache and itch, making her so very sore and weary. A gust of smoke blew past her, making her eyes water again. She grumbled a bit in frustration, but got back to work. Meredy glanced over at her and smiled, laying her own berry bush carefully onto the pile. "'Crying for the bushes, are you?' she said. "'It's the smoke,' Katie replied. "'The wind is westerly today. We should be thankful it's not from the south. 
Then it would be hot and smoky. Katie glanced at the skies again. All clear. Then she searched out the next berry bush, shoving a few shrubs aside. The berry bushes were scattered here and there. Some were hidden, some were out in plain sight, but it was never more than ten or so steps between them. Some were shiny, some were dull, some had big, fat, round-looking berries, others had tiny little pellet berries no bigger than a seed. Some were brightly colored, others were gray as stones, but they all had to go. She found one and pressed her fork into the roots of it. It was a pretty little bush with pink berries, each berry crowned with white flowers. She had been yanking berry bushes for nearly a year, and she had never seen one like this. She paused, just staring at it. Meredith stepped up beside her. Those are maiden's kiss berries, the old woman said. They make a boy's cheeks as pink as though he were kissed by the prettiest girl you ever saw. We used to use them to embarrass the young men of our village when I was a girl. They never did much to a girl's cheeks that we ever knew. But maybe it's because girls' cheeks are pink already. You, you smeared them on a boy's cheeks? Katie asked. The berries were pink and juicy. She imagined they left quite a stain. No, Meredith said, laughing her breathy little coughing laugh. We'd squeeze the juice into the boy's tea. He'd gulp it down and his cheeks would be pink all day. She laughed again, remembering. But they're poison. If somebody ate these... Katie looked at her as though she had lost her mind. No, Meredith said, shaking her head sadly. They're not poison. That's just what the king told everyone. It's all lies, though. The berries are magic. Really, they are. If only people remembered the old ways. Katie sighed. This magic berry business again. Bah! That kind of talk would be the death of the old woman yet. And next would be a long, rambling speech about all the village traditions and myths. She was far too hot and tired to endure it right now. There's no such thing as magic berries, Meredy. Be quiet about that. I don't want to get in trouble. The guards! Katie kicked her fork in and yanked out the maiden's kiss bush. They sure didn't look poisonous. They were actually quite pretty. She pulled the bush from the earth and took it to the pile. Meredy was still chattering away as though Katie hadn't even left. Maybe the old woman really had lost her mind. A few sips and the boy's cheeks would be pink as a maiden's lips, Meredy muttered on. She turned slowly away, troubled by some ache in her back, and started searching half-heartedly through the thicket for a bush to uproot. We had berries that would heal wounds and sickness, berries that could make you strong as a horse, berries that were good for eating. We even had berries that could make you tall as a house. Why... My brother ate four of them once, and he had to sleep outside for a week. He couldn't fit through the door. <laughs> she laughed again, and this time the guard heard her. Quiet, old woman, his voice boomed annoyed. Keep working or he'll be yanking bushes with a bleeding back. Meredith hushed. She sighed sadly. You see, Katie whispered, stop babbling like a silly old goose and keep working. Better to be a silly old goose than a monster, Meredith replied. You may not like it, but it's beatings for both of us if you dawdle and fuss, and I have no wish to go through that again. The guards used fresh-cut sapling branches on dawdlers, slashing and whipping them mercilessly back to work if they lagged. Occasionally, entire families would be lashed to trees and beaten, as she and Meredith had been a few months ago. She'd ached for days after that. But Meredy had nearly died. Katie was bitter about that for a long time. She kicked her wooden fork in and continued. She remembered splashing in the river with friends when she was little. She remembered chasing her baby brother through the trails around the village. She remembered hearing great stories by the fire under the stars at night. She remembered the village song, how the melody seemed to dance in the air all around her as the entire village sang together. She remembered feeling so peaceful and content, sitting between her mother and father. It was a feeling she hadn't felt since then. All she had now was the memory. Now everything was just sadness, weariness, mud and smoke, ash and pain, 
hunger, thirst, and work, work, work. Back then there had been no shadow to worry about. Katie checked the sky once more and adjusted the rags that kept her hands from blistering. The pile of dying bushes was nearly waist-high now. The cartman came along and took it away, gathering up every last berry to be sure they never sprouted again. Even the very seeds had to be destroyed, every last one of them. Chuff, 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 work, work, work. A little hard work never hurt anybody, Katie's father used to say, but it did hurt. It hurt a lot, day after day without end. It hurt less than the beatings you got for not working, though. Her father had been one of the first to stand up and fight the shadow when it had swooped down with that horrible scream. The other men cowered and ran for cover, even the soldiers, but her father had snatched a spear from a guard and charged forward. The shadow had seen him coming and screeched defiantly, dodging the hurled spear with a hop that rumbled the world and then it had torn the roof right off a hut with its terrible claws and flung it at the lone warrior who dared to make a stand. That was the last time Katie had seen her father alive. He dodged to the right, but not quick enough. Katie missed him, but it was her mother's death a few weeks later that had broken her heart. Her mother had fallen while fetching water for the workers. People said the tears of grief over her lost husband had blinded her. She stumbled and fell from the cliff by the waterfall, falling into the raging waters below, never to be seen again. It had broken Katie's heart, because now she and Darby were all alone. Meredith had taken them in, and she'd done her best to care for them, but it could never be the same as the family they'd once had. And things had gotten worse as the years of constant labor passed. The once hardy people were thin, weary, half-starved, covered in bandages and scars, as withered as the forest itself. Hearts in the village had slowly turned bitter. The people had once turned to Meredith for guidance and relief, but she had no answers. The old ways of life had ended. There was little she could do but teach them the best ways to bandage the small wounds they got while working. She tried to give one young woman some crushed berries to salve her blisters. Healing berries, she'd called them, but the guard had backhanded her for it knocking her to the earth. I ought to whip you for trying to poison her like that. Meredith had apologized, wiping away a tear with a shaking hand. The old ways were gone. The years had passed, and Katie had watched the lush forest around their village slowly turn to dead stony earth beneath the trees. When the berry bushes were pulled and burned, the other grasses and shrubs around them seemed to wither too. Nobody knew why. Some said it was from the people's trampling back and forth through the woods, where they shouldn't go. But the guards had told them it was because the berries were poison, that once they were gone the forest would return, brighter and more beautiful than ever. That seemed to make sense, but Katie somehow doubted it. Something unnatural was happening. Something wrong. Trees wilted, dropped their leaves, and died as well, even beneath the replenishing spring rains and the bright summer sun. Dead trees were cut down for firewood and tools, leaving bare stony earth behind, and now the land looked wounded, sick, and sad. And the deadness spread for a long way, spreading outward in a circle around the village. Every new morning it took them longer and longer to walk out to the edge of the growth where the day's work begun. Every night there was an even longer distance to walk home through the haze of smoke, drifting ashes, muck, sludge, and dying forest. Eventually, villagers had been set to the task of creating pebbled paths through the mud and mire. The little wooden huts of the village stood like rows of bad teeth on the edge of the Ethne River. Some homes had been destroyed in the shadow raids. Some were partially repaired, some were blackened by fires. The only part of the village that seemed in any decent shape was the graveyard. The half-destroyed homes should have been repaired or removed long ago but the guards would barely let families stop to bury their dead, never mind that maintain their homes. Every day was spent clearing berry bushes from morning till night. The devastation was a constant reminder of the horrors of the past. The people kept one eye on the skies, always listening for the warning bell. On a clear day, if the smoke wasn't too thick, Katie could see all the way to the village between the dead trees. You weren't supposed to be able to see all the way to the village, there was supposed to be a forest in between, with a wagon trail winding down from the town of Yenti a few miles to the west. 
Katie could never get used to the sight of bare dead earth stretching out all the way back to the village. She preferred to face the woods ahead. There was still life in that direction. Katie wasn't the only one who felt that way. Sometimes Merity worked with tears flowing down her face, apologizing to each berry bush before she tugged it from the earth. Sometimes she whispered prayers, asking forgiveness. At night, around cook fires, people said that every village in the kingdom was the same as theirs, that King Theron had his armies camped in every town and village, setting the entire kingdom to the destruction of every berry bush in the world. Katie wasn't sure if this was true. She'd never been to any of the other villages. She only knew what people muttered back and forth as they ate their evening meals after sundown, whispering beneath the raucous reveling of the guards in their nearby tents. "'I tell you this is unnatural,' one man said as Katie sewed a patch onto her skirt. "'The gods will curse us for this. We're destroying the world. We ought to run. We ought to find help.' Some nodded, others disagreed. "'Run where? Find help from who?' The entire world is the same, in every direction as far as you could run. Every village is up to the same dirty business we are. Curse us. The gods are the only thing that can help us. Stop this foolish talk of running. Pray instead. Merity had nodded, listening with her eyes closed. Katie couldn't imagine prayer would do much good against a king who was powerful enough to enslave the entire world. She would prayed constantly when the village had first been taken over. But five years later, and after the death of both her parents, she'd realized that if there were any gods at all, they were apparently deaf. She preferred the bad news of the world at large to the stories of the shadow, though. Talk of the king's tyranny soon gave way to muttering about the great black terror in the skies. Huddle close, children, an old woman whispered. You don't want the shadow snatching you up and carrying you away like so many others. Huddle close. "'Why does the shadow steal children?' a frightened little boy asked, his eyes wide, shining with fear in the firelight. "'For food! Why else?' the old woman replied, jabbing a stick into the fire and stirring angry ashes to fly up and die on their way to the stars above. The children shivered, cuddling even closer to their parents, afraid to look up at the empty black sky. Derby gripped Katie's arm a little tighter, but said nothing. Derby never talked. Katie didn't think it was true, though, about the shadow eating little kids. If the shadow was eating the children, wouldn't he come back for more every day? And wouldn't he grab the adults instead of the children if he was grabbing them for food? Adults were bigger. She never voiced her doubts, though. She kept a lot of thoughts to herself by the fires at night. She was fifteen and a girl. Nobody cared what she had to say. "'Ask fewer questions and you'll get fewer whippings,' the guards were fond of saying. It was daytime now. The skies were clear. Things were quiet. But silence did not mean safety. It had been a few months since the last child was snatched from their village, and people were starting to say that the bird was due for another visit.'